we have to. Am I? Oh, sorry. Sorry, I can do this. Sorry. Uh, I have to speak. I'll speak quietly so allow Morgan just to. No. Oh. Yes. <laughs> Done it wrong already. Okay, is that? Okay. So we all have to speak in hushed tones. And if you're sitting down there, you have to keep your mask on. And when we sing, keep it in hushed tones as well. Uh, and I've heard some of you singing, so that's a good thing. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, imagine just. Right at the beginning of this, I'm really insulting you, so sorry if I can cut. Um, there, there are just a few wee things, obviously, if this is your first time back in, sent here for a while, you've obviously been ushered in and you'll be ushered back out and all of that kind of thing, and we're keeping it uh, all very um, safe and restricted, so I'm only allowed to stand here as long as these two are sitting on their seats. When they stand up, I have to go over there. But aside from that, we're trying not to move around so much. So you will notice today that our Bible readings and prayers will come up on the screen. Uh, they've been recorded in advance, so nobody needs to walk up the front and use a microphone. Uh, but that's really. So we're, we're working away at how all this happens. And today, we're again streaming online, and we've got a microphone on this this week. See if it'll make it a wee bit better. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think the sound wasn't completely good last week, but thank you for being here this morning. Um, so, again, one of the things that helps us not to project our voices out is actually to remain seated. So it will feel strange at times, but it's, uh, it's better for us all if we just remain seated. So we are hoping to be done in under an hour, so it isn't too long, but if at any point during uh, the service you need to rub your bottom, feel free to just give your, but just your own, okay, just rub your own bottom uh, and uh, make sure you're comfortable. So, um, the announcements will scroll at the end. I encourage you to look at those, read the emails, check the website and the app, uh, make sure you, you see what's going on, and we will try to get information out because some things will change as we go along. It's inevitable that, that things keep developing a little bit. So, we're going to start by um, we're still in the resurrection Easter uh, season. So, um, is it thank you, the glory? Oh, I stand in this. Oh, but please sit up here and see. <laughs> okay. But you're, yes. <laughs>
It says on the script a short pause to consider the past week. And then we're coming to that moment of confession of our sin. Uh, but let's pause for another wee moment. Um, like I said, our prayers have been recorded for us. Uh, they were recorded this week uh, before we heard about Prince Philip's death. Uh, so that isn't included in the prayers. So can we just take a short pause now, uh, just to remember that whole family and uh, this moment in the life of our nation.
our Bible readings this morning come from over here. But we're going to listen to it and watch it up here. After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Doubt in the context of a church service 
or a Bible study. It's a bit like a skeleton to be kept away in the cupboard. But you know the best thing to do with a skeleton that's in a cupboard is get it out and have a look at it and see if it's as scary as you thought it might be. And inevitably it won't be. So I'd like us to do that this morning just for a few moments. To consider the role of doubt in our faith. And we can disguise the word doubt by calling it questions. Do we ever have questions? And I have to say the last 12 months has raised questions in my life. And when I wrote that down, I immediately wrote straight after it. Could I add that the last 40 years of my life has raised questions for me? And some of my questions are as recent as this last week, this last few days. How do we as a community here in Northern Ireland seem to be so absolutely committed to conflict and division when we're one of the most Christianized pieces of ground on the planet? When we think of the heroes, when you think of the risks that people have taken, when you think of the courage that people have shown in crossing boundaries and barriers, when you think of the risks that even some of our politicians have taken, how does it keep going wrong? When you think of the prayer meetings we've attended, when you think of the March for Jesus as we've marched up and down the streets of this city, when you think of the outreaches we've been involved in, the summer camps, the, all the things that, we, that have happened in this wee bit of land, how does it keep going wrong? And over the years, I know in our wider family, and I don't just mean Janice and me, but the wider McCartneys and all the in-laws, the questions that have been raised by the deaths of children and of young adults and of jobs lost and money squandered and relationships broken and bitterness that doesn't seem to get healed. And I don't want you to think for a moment that we live in the worst family in the world. I think if you spread any of our families out, we'll discover that these things are amongst all of us. Why does it happen? How does it not get fixed? How, how do my prayers not seem to sort it all out all the time? So there's an element of doubt somewhere hidden away inside when these things come along. But quite often we find it difficult to express it or say it. And even standing in front of you this morning saying some of these things, I'm feeling quite nervous about how can a church leader really have questions like that going on inside his or her head or heart. I'm going to just say that the Bible gives us permission to think and feel these things. Psalm 6, I'm worn out from sobbing. All night I flood my bed with weeping, drenching it with my tears. That's the words of somebody heartbroken. Psalm 10, O Lord, why do you stand so far away? Why do you hide when I'm in trouble, when I'm in trouble? That's the words of someone who feels they've been let down or let go. Help, O oh Lord, for the godly are fast disappearing. The faithful have vanished from the earth. That's the words of someone who thinks it's all going away from them. O oh Lord, how long will you forget me forever? How long will you look the other way? How long must I struggle with anguish in my soul, with sorrow in my heart every day? The words of someone who's losing hope. And these are all written by faithful people in the Bible. And even in our resurrection stories that we heard read to us this morning, there are strange descriptions of the people who were in the inner circle of God's, of Jesus' movement way back 20 centuries ago, when he said to some of them, and these are in the resurrection moments, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. He's speaking to people who aren't grasping what he has been telling them. And he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. It's almost as if Jesus can't believe. How can they still not believe this? And then Thomas, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were, I will not believe. Peter, who's just been to the empty tomb, went home again, 
wondering what had happened. So there are questions in us. There are doubts in us at times when life assaults us. Um, and yet there's a cling to faith in us as well. So could I, could I just say, I, I want to say a couple of things. One is that doubt and questions are not the opposite of faith. In fact, they're not even necessarily a challenge to faith. Someone once said that the greater challenge to faith is not doubt, but certainty. If you're absolutely certain of something. Oh. If you're absolutely certain of something, you don't even need to know why it happens. It just will happen. You don't have to have faith that that's going to fall on the ground. It will happen. You see, faith takes us beyond and into the realm of things that you can't always be certain about. That's the very nature of faith. Hebrews 11 1 says, Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It's the evidence of things we cannot see. If faith could be proved, it reduces the actual element of faith in that. I brought the bike home along. And Ken knows all about the value of the bike helmet, don't you, Ken? Yeah. Because when you fall off, uh, I have a daughter who spent a few years in a and &E at the Ulster, and she said, this has saved more lives than you could ever imagine. Because the certainty of gravity will take your head to the ground if you fall off the bike. And it would be ridiculous to say, I have faith that my head will hit the ground. It will. But faith does take us beyond the things that can simply be proved. That's why it's called faith. There's something that takes us beyond this, beyond the things we can see and touch. So why on earth would we believe in things like the resurrection? Will we believe because there's written evidence about it? 1 Corinthians 15, let me read you a few words. Paul writing, I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me, that Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. He was seen, and I get this bit, he was seen by Peter and then by the 12, and after that he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James, and later by, oh, pages are mixed up, by all the apostles, and last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I, Paul, also saw him. There's a wee phrase in there. He was seen by more than 500 followers at one time, most of whom are still alive. And I think what Paul is actually saying to the right to the readers of First Corinthians is that um, there are hundreds of witnesses out there that Jesus walked around alive after his resurrection, and therefore you can go and ask them. You don't have to just believe this this letter that I've written. There are people you can talk to, and that's the words of someone who's absolutely convinced of what he himself has seen. He's inviting people to investigate this and see whether or not it is true. How do we know that Julius Caesar invaded Britain in 55 BC? It's written down. There are reliable written sources that could have been challenged when they were written. Paul's writings could have been challenged but weren't. They were accepted as accurate by the contemporaries of his day. That's partly why we believe in this resurrection, because the textual evidence is there for us, and that's how we know anything in history. And the other reason why we believe, or why our faith can be rooted in something, it's the reaction of the people who saw Jesus alive. What changed in their lives? Paul wrote these words, 
Why should we ourselves risk our lives hour by hour? For I swear, dear brothers and sisters, that I face death daily. This is as certain as my pride in what Christ Jesus our Lord has done in you. And what value was there in fighting wild beasts in Ephesus if there will be no resurrection from the dead? Do you get what Paul said there? Paul has been in the arena fighting the wild animals because he refused to say that Jesus was not alive. Would you do that if you thought it had been made up? If you thought this had been invented by a group of people, it's a good story, it's a good end to the story of Jesus. Would you give your life for something you thought had been made up? The reaction of the people who spread this story, Paul goes on to say, if there is no resurrection, let's just feast and drink, for tomorrow we die. But they lived this out, and they gave their lives for it. They were absolutely convinced of this. Well, it's, it's part of the testimony that when people will give their lives for something. But let's jump to the most famous doubt of all. One of the twelve disciples, Thomas, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, we've seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands and put my fingers into them, and place my hands into the wound in his side. Right, he, I've been reading this this week, I'm trying to, trying to imagine myself inside the head of Thomas. What was going on there? And I think there's a wee bit of Thomas feeling left out. Why would Jesus appear to the rest of them and not to me? Am I not one of these? There's something like that going on, and there's a, a sort of resistance. Well, you know what? I'm just not going to believe it then, unless I actually see it myself. Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and Thomas was with them. Now, there's another weak key phrase. In the midst of questions, and of doubts, and of fears, Thomas could have walked away and said, I don't believe this. Jesus hasn't appeared to me. Why has he left me out? He could have walked away. But eight days later, he's still with them. He has refused to move, even though he said, I will not. Strangely, he's still there, which makes me think that inside of him, there's, oh, I wish I could. I really want to. He's not prepared to leave. He's hanging in there. And could I say that in times of doubt, and of question, and of fear, and of feeling left down with God, or anything else, could I encourage you, Never leave the company of other brothers and sisters in Christ. Because it will be in their midst, as Thomas found, that he encountered the resurrected Christ. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand into the wood to my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. Thomas exclaimed, my Lord and my God. You see, doubt and questions don't have to take you away from God at all. They can actually be woven into our faith to the point that we discover God in even greater ways. By having the courage to open the cupboard and let the skeleton of doubt and fear and questions have a little bit of room in our lives rather than trying to shove it away and pretend it's never there. Sometimes when we have some of those questions and we continue to go on waiting for God, that it will take us to a point of greater revelation of who God is. The doubting questions isn't the opposite of our faith, nor does it even have to destroy our faith. It can enrich it and deepen it and take us closer to God. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. But then Jesus said, and get this, because here's where we come in. 
sit in these pews in Beaver. Jesus said to Thomas, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. That's us. Blessed are we who believe without touching his hands and his wound. Because that's a deeper faith. Yeah? Anybody could believe in gravity because you can see it all the time. But this faith that we're talking about is believing in something that is deep inside of us and I have absolutely no doubt that there are encounters with God in this room among all of us as we have worshipped God, as we pray to God, as we walk with God, as we uh, minister to the poor, as we've reached out to the sick, as we've been around people who are dying. Uh, in all sorts of ways, we will have encountered the living Christ. But it's always by faith. So today, could I encourage you in this resurrection season, could I encourage you to believe, to have faith, that isn't always searching for certainty, but is prepared to live with the possibility that some things are not going to be known by us. But also a faith that doesn't run away from things being difficult and wanting to find a nice simple answer for everything difficult and awkward that happens around us. And a faith in this resurrection season that will bring us closer to God. In the midst of more political upheaval, in the midst of things we've been praying for this week and the last few weeks, and if you're involved in any of the week prayer, WhatsApp groups or any of those things, there are some incredibly difficult situations around us at the moment. And at times you can only, I don't know about the rest of you, but I find myself praying and wondering what is going on? How does it not work? Why is this like this? Why does it go on and on and on? But I find myself closer to God in the wrestling with it. And in the struggling with it, I'm saying, Lord, would you help us to pray again? So I want to encourage today, uh, the politicians use the word robust all these, day, all these days all the time, don't they? But everything has to be robust. But could we, could we learn to have a robust faith that even in the midst of things that seem to go wrong around us and the things that are awkward and awful in our world, that we carry the questions and the fears along with the belief and the faith. And we find ourselves whispering. Thomas explained it, but even get used to whispering, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. I think we're going to sing something that will help us just express that a little bit. So um, please just where you are, could we even be a Thomas here and just reach out. I'm doing a song even whisper, my Lord and my God.
my Lord and my God. The Lord be with you. No. Let us pray. Our Father, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Make your ways known upon the earth, Lord God, your saving power among all peoples. Renew your church in holiness, and help us to serve you with joy. Guide the leaders of this and every nation, that justice may prevail throughout the world. Let not the needy be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Make us instruments of your peace, and let your glory be over all the earth. Morning. As we begin to pray, let us remember the words in Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 to 23. That the faithful love of the Lord never ceases. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance, therefore I will hope in him. So as we pray today, let us place our hope in him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the message of Easter. Thank you for dying on the cross so that we can be forgiven. For rising from the dead so that we can know that our lives don't finish at the grave. Thank you, Lord, for your good news and help us like the first disciples to share it with others. God, we place our hope in you. Father, we thank you that many of our children have already been back at school, and we thank you that all your groups are returning tomorrow. We pray for any who are feeling anxious, that they would find they really enjoy being back in familiar surroundings and routines. We pray for wisdom for teachers and classroom assistants as they settle everyone back in. Father, for those who should be doing major exams in May and June and are now facing a different form of assessment, we pray for peace and confidence in the new systems. For the teachers who will be doing the assessments, we ask for your wisdom and guidance as they too cope with new ways of doing things. We pray for smooth transitions from primary school to post-primary and from post-primary to third level education or to employment. Father, we ask for your protection on everyone in schools, further education colleges and universities from the spread of coronavirus and that everyone will be able to complete this academic year with face-to-face -face teaching. God, we place our hope in you. For our country at this time, Father, we pray that our government, political leaders and community leaders will be able to bring peace again to our streets. Lord, we pray that the violence would stop and that people would see other peaceful ways to resolve disagreements and feelings of fear or threat. God, we place our hope in you. Father, we thank you that we're beginning to meet again as a church family face to face. Thank you for the ways we've been able to stay connected during the various lockdowns and for all the people who have made that possible. We pray that you would continue to guide us as a church here in Beaver. Show us how to connect with our community so that we can share your good news and see lives transformed. We pray for the annual General Vestry meeting next Sunday, asking that those elected 
we have vision and commitment to see your church here grow. Lord, we place our hope in you. Father, we want to bring those who are sick and suffering at this time. We want to pray especially for Trevor Orr. Thank you for signs of improvement over the last few days. And we continue to pray for complete healing. Help Trevor, Alison and the girls to know your warm embrace as you carry them through this difficult time. Then in time of quiet, let us bring others we have been praying for to God in prayer. God, we place our hope in you. As we go through this week, remind us afresh that your faithful love never ceases and that your mercies are new every morning. And we pray all our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing our final hymn.
Thank you all for being here. And uh, did you notice before the service started, I'm sure you were here when they were just finishing rehearsal. And did you, did you, did you listen to them? Did you listen to John and Jeffrey swapping instructions? We'll do the, we'll switch to B flat and then we'll have an appoggiatura followed by a diminuendo, and then into a wee bit of an andante line. And can I just say that um, nothing takes more rehearsal than spontaneity. So uh, thank you for organizing yourselves and being like this and the others who've helped put this together for us. Now I'm gonna slip out, Jazz, you wanna with me? And we'll go outside. I noticed some folks didn't get it. Uh, so we'll go outside and uh, you'll be shown out. You'll be helped out. Thank you.